All right, well, let me get started then, now that we've overcome some of the technical uh, glitches, I guess, of starting, starting the Zoom. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, be with you guys today and to present, um, present uh, my work on virtual reality uh, for uh, therapeutic opportunities. What I'm showing you here is a picture of me with uh, one of our now roughly 3,000 patients at Cedar sinai who has used virtual reality um, for a variety of different conditions, including, in this case, pain. She's allowed us to show her image, and she's contemplating whether or not to use this VR headset to help manage her pain. So for the next, uh, you know, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to share stories and data with our experiences using VR, like, like this young man here, and I'll show a video of him later. And since this really is a visual art, I want to start with some, some pictures. And here is a patient who has sickle cell anemia, also has allowed us to show his image. And he is um, in currently uh, flying over fjords in Iceland in a helicopter. Uh, moments before, he was doubled over in pain uh, in his chest and in his uh, long bones from a sickle cell anemia pain crisis. Here is a... Um, another patient who has uh, cirrhosis. She has chronic liver disease and she has had recurrent severe abdominal pain uh, from fluid buildup in her belly. And at this moment, she's in Hawaii and I'll show you a video a little bit later of her experience using virtual reality and how it provided benefits, not only just while in the VR, but as we're learning, even for some time after having been in virtual reality. So we'll talk a bit about that. So this is uh, one of the different types of headsets that we use. Uh, this happens to be the Oculus Go. We use a number of different headsets, the Oculus. We've used the Samsung Gear VR in the past, which we no longer use because it requires a smartphone to clip in. Now we use these all-in-one devices. We've used the Google Daydream. We've used the Pico G2. We've used the Oculus Quest. For me, it really doesn't matter. And I, I say that because as long as the headset is good enough, the headset is kind of like a syringe. And what I mean by that is a, it's not the syringe that matters, it's what medicine goes through the syringe that matters. And in this case, it's not the headset that matters, it's what software are we putting through the headset? What are patients experiencing, seeing, feeling? What are they thinking about? That's the therapeutic arm of immersive um, technologies like VR. And I'll talk more about that concept and how the FDA is starting to think about that concept as well. So I hadn't even really heard of VR until about five years ago when Walter Greenleaf, who is a professor at Stanford, came to my office with a, a team of programmers and he asked me to put on this VR headset. And I'm showing you a picture of what I saw when I first put on this VR headset. And I put it on and I was standing in a conference room. And next thing I know that conference room is transformed into this scene where I find myself this person going up the side of a 50-story building in this window washer room and I can hear the creeping of the cables and I can feel the swaying of the platform even though of course it's all right here we are and on the 500 feet up on the side of the building trail, of a oh, guy I hope you're not afraid of heights. Uh, you're now up on the top of this building, and I look over. take a look down at the ground now. Details like and how it freaks people out. Shade and even the splash. I love looking down at people from up there. And although I feel like it's too long, next thing I know, this thing falls right off, and snap back to the wall behind Whoa. me. And you're I right. realize, like, I'm going to the gate off. And the guy says to me, listen, why don't you go ahead and jump off that? that you know this isn't real, right? He said, no way, it's I'm not going to Let's have some fun and step off the platform. But don't jump. And I always say, this don't tip though either, story. that's my cheating. Thought they were standing on Just the take one large, my confident brain, step my brain 500 up. feet into the virtual up. air. And the only way I was really able to jump off of this was I had to take a little oh, baby step Come on. and just sort of wheel myself over the side. That's when I know I die. I, and that's the first time I ever experienced virtual reality. And I thought, wow, that was just a, it completely commandeered my brain. My brain had been hijacked in virtual reality. And I came to recognize the power of how radically VR can alter consciousness. 
And I thought, wow, if it could be used for evil like this, then there must be a way that we can use it for good too. And that's what we've been working on for the past five years. I'm gonna tell you those stories. So this is the first time that I died in virtual reality. And now I wanna talk about the second time that I died in virtual reality. And it was actually at the University of Barcelona where I traveled uh, over to Spain to visit with a professor named Mel Slater. And Dr. Slater, Professor Slater, is a professor of virtual reality. And he's been conducting some of the most cutting edge applications of VR of anyone in the world. So I went to his laboratory and I found myself uh, in this nondescript, rather dank, dark, kind of black room with these drapes surrounding me. And they put me in this room and one of his graduate students, Ramon Olivas, came up to me and he asked me to put my feet up on that table in front of me. And he then uh, gave me a headset after he put vibration motors on my ankles and on my wrists. And they put on a VR headset, and all of a sudden, those dark drapes turned into this rather beautiful scene. It was a really elegant living room with wood paneling and well-apportioned furniture and a chandelier uh, up on the ceiling. And I noticed that my feet were right out in front of me on that table, just as they had been in real life. And I looked around and they said, listen, why don't you start moving your feet around on that table? We're gonna draw a line and we want you to follow that line, that blue line with your heel. And I did it and I started to think, what's going on here? Because are those my legs? because when I move my real legs, those legs move at the exact same time in the exact same coordinates in space. And I realized that there's a computer somewhere in that room running thousands of lines of code to convince my brain that I had inhabited this digital doppelganger. But it sure felt like it. It was like something out of the matrix. But to go a step further, the next thing he did is he dropped these balls, these spherical, you know, digital objects from the ceiling that my brain interpreted as balls. And each time a ball struck my body, I could physically feel its presence on my body. I could feel a vibration on my body from the vibration engine that he had embedded in the suit. So now I had what he calls full virtual embodiment. I now believe that I was in fact this body. So once that is achieved, there are amazing things that can happen. And what happened next is really hard to describe in words. It's kind of almost a spiritual experience for me as I think back and tell the story, sort of indelible, hard to really put into words. But I'll just explain it and I will show you what, I, what, what happened in two dimensions. And you just have to do your best to imagine what it feels like in three dimensions. Next thing I know, the, the, my observing self, I guess the ego self some, somewhere within my brain detached from my physical body. And I started to float back up towards the ceiling. And those balls followed me and they kept striking my body and I kept feeling them. But I looked down and I recognized that I had been detached from that body down below. And that body was no longer moving. That body was vacant. I'm repeating it again just to show you that I had essentially had an out-of-body experience. I had died. And in the process of dying, I recognized it, it wasn't catastrophic. It was kind of mystical, kind of spiritual in a way. And, it, and at that moment, I almost came to realize without knowing it, that the process of passing away need not be tragic unto itself. Well, that was striking to me that something like VR could do that. And it turns out that Professor Slater has been doing this and published this paper, a virtual out-of-body experience reduces fear of death. And in this study, he took people who did not know this was a study about fear of death. He just exposed them to this experience and he had a randomized schema where some people experienced this out-of-body uh, version and others did not. And about a week later, he asked them all, how worried are you about these different aspects of dying? About missing out on so much after you die and dying young and what it's going to feel like to be dead and so on. Pretty um, kind of gruesome in a way, but what he found was that people that had this out-of-body experience were statistically less concerned about dying. Now, I can say that having gone through this, I fear death just a little bit less. I still don't want to die, 
I'm still afraid of dying. But I can say that I, in a durable way, have a slightly less uh, a severe concept of what it means to die. Having been through this 10 minute experience once in my life. Uh, and the question is what happened in my brain when this was occurring? What was going on? And the point here is that VR is a tool that can modify perception. When many people think of VR, they think of a gaming platform for kids to play first person shooter games in their parents' basement or something like that. And it is that, but it's so much more than that. And that's the opportunity that I'm talking about today. Because if we use VR to recalibrate unhealthy perceptions, perceptions about the world around you, perceptions about the world within you, then VR becomes a radical new therapy that has potential to improve quality of life. So what was happening in my brain when I had that out-of-body experience? Well, there was a sense of selflessness, as if the ego self had dissolved. And anyone who has studied or practiced meditation recognizes that that is one of the goals of meditation, is to turn off that thinking self, to turn off the ego self, and as a result, achieve this selflessness, what some people call non-dual consciousness, meaning there is no longer a distinction between me and the world around me. And that is a beautiful feeling as somebody that meditates every day. I, I try my best to achieve that. And VR did it within seconds. Now, some people might turn to other approaches like pharmacological approaches to achieving this selflessness and this sense of flow. This is the magic mushroom. Psilocybin, a psychedelic, is a very powerful agent that will also inhibit that sense of self in the same way that meditation does. So the question is, is VR able to do something similar to this? Well, we know what's happening in the brain when somebody is taking a psychedelic, for example. What's happening is on the left is before the psychedelic and on the right is during the psychedelic. And what's interesting is, although it looks like there's a lot more activity, because there is, the psychedelic is actually inhibiting this sort of central hub of consciousness called the default mode network, or also called the DMN. The default mode network is a series of structures in the brain that essentially is the inner source of your blabbering voice, the inner fretting, critiquing, judging, upset, emotional center that's sort of strategically thinking every moment of the day instead of being in the now. And when that DMN is inhibited, the brain is able to achieve lateral thinking. It's almost as if the conductor of the orchestra, who serves an important role, has been asked to leave and step out for a while, and the rest of the orchestra can have jam sessions. And that could be cacophonous, the equivalent of a bad trip maybe, but it can also be beautiful and harmonious. So that's what's happening with meditation and certainly with psychedelics. And the question is, is VR doing the same thing? Well, what you're looking at here is a image from a study from Anil Seth at the University of Sussex, who did a study to compare psilocybin, the magic mushroom ingredient, directly against a form of virtual reality. And what you're seeing is one of the VR experiences where research subjects wore a headset and they could see through the headset, but it permuted the environment using augmented reality to change it into like a weird dolly painting where the ground was shimmering, there are dog heads on people walking by. It's a very bizarre experience. And he asked people to rate the phenomenology of this experience. What was the felt experience like? And there's a questionnaire for that. And then he had a control group that used psilocybin for the same experience. And he compared them side by side in this radar diagram, looking at different aspects of sort of mysticism. And he compared what he called the hallucination machine, which was his, um, his uh, AR, VR, or MR, we'll call it mixed reality intervention, versus psilocybin, and found that they were essentially equivalent experiences. And now what's happening is some psychiatrists are combining virtual reality with ketamine, which is a form of a psychedelic, and finding that it can actually standardize the experience in a way that improves the ketamine outcomes. Now this is one of many different 
ex uh, experiences that we use with our patients. This is from a company called Trip VR. Uh, I don't have a relationship with Trip other than I like their software. And uh, it is available through the Oculus Store and it's available um, for our patients. We use this and it's essentially designed to simulate uh, a psychedelic. It's a cyberdelic. And um, that's a term that's been around for a long time. And you can go through these different environments every day and it can be personalized where you can literally see scenes from your own life come through. You can put in photographs that come through and are integrated within the world around you. And it's like dreaming with your eyes wide open. And the goal of this is to reproduce the sort of selfless feeling of a psychedelic. And as we'll talk about later, as we get into specific examples of medicine, this has potential to help with anxiety, to help with depression, to help with pain. I want to give you another example of, uh, of a simpler software that we use this is from the Dolphin Swim Club, a not-for-profit foundation in Europe that goes around the world using videos. And in this case, they have filmed a beautiful scene of a dolphin pod. And we give this to our patients who are able to swim underwater with dolphins. And in this um, instance, in one instance in particular I want to tell you about, uh, I took care of a patient had recurrent abdominal pain. And I happen to be a gastroenterologist, so I was asked to help investigate why she was having pain. And it turned out that she had had pain for quite some time. And she had uh, had multiple tests, a CT scan and endoscopies, lab tests, and nothing had really clearly shown the source of her pain. So she was in the hospital and I put this on her head as a VR headset and I explained where it's gonna happen, she put it on. And she watched these dolphins. And for about four or five minutes, she was silent, really doing nothing but taking it all in. And then she started to cry. And I said, are you okay? And she said, yes. She said, I think I figured out why I have this pain. And I said, really, tell me more. And she said, it's my brother. I said, your brother? Said, yes, my brother. My brother had stomach cancer and he died and I'm going to die like he died. And that's why I have this pain. And I said, I know, but you looked in your stomach and you don't have stomach cancer, right? You, you talked about that. She said, I know you guys keep telling me I don't have stomach pain, but I haven't been willing to accept it. But these dolphins, they're telling me I need to accept it. I need to move on. And it was remarkable. He said, a year on the couch and I would never have come to this realization. There's something about being in this world that's allowing me to think differently about this problem. Now, I didn't have a functional MRI scan to sort of roll into her room during this, but if I did, I probably would have seen that that default mode network had shut down. And the rest of her brain was making connections that it normally couldn't. And she could have maybe practiced for 10,000 hours to meditate to get to that point. But it seems that VR was able to skip that step and bring her right to that realization. Now, this doesn't happen every time in every patient, but it does happen. And it's a remarkable thing for a headset to be able to achieve this kind of outcome. So what do we know about the pain? And I talked about how her pain was getting better. Talked a little bit about the default mode network and what VR does there. But what about pain? This is a very famous study from Hunter Hoffman at the University of Washington, where he used virtual reality alongside pain. And what he did uh, on the left here is an example of a functional MRI of the brain of a research subject who has a hot thermal probe placed on his or her foot. And of course that hurts. And you can see these signals in the brain, both in the sensory cortex of the brain, where you physically feel the intensity of the pain, but you'll notice that there are also signals here in the middle of the brain. This is the limbic system and the insular cortex, the place where you process the emotions related to that pain. And then when the same subject puts on a virtual reality headset, you see that it tamps down both the sensory component of pain and the emotional component of pain. That's very profound that VR can reduce pain in both ways. How is it doing that? Well, there's a series of explanations. It has something to do with inattentional blindness, which means essentially distraction, that we can't keep track of so many things at once. 
Like as you're listening to this discussion, if you're not otherwise checking your email or maybe checking your smartphone, it's very hard to listen to a talk like this or any talk and also to keep track of how many times you blinked in the last minute or feel the pressure of the chair under your bottom or the pressure of the floor on your feet. It's just too much for the brain to take in at once. So if the brain is overwhelmed with a fantastical world in virtual reality, it can't at the same time easily keep track of pain. And that's the idea of inattentional blindness. But it also appears that it can change the perception of time. People feel like the pain lasts a shorter period of time. And it also over time can allow people to regain uh, skills about how to manage their, their mind at times of pain, even when they're not in the virtual reality. So we'll talk more about that. So it was the Buddha many years ago who said pain has two arrows. The first arrow is when the archer strikes your body with the arrow and it hurts, it physically hurts. But the second arrow is the self-inflicted wound. This is when you look at the first arrow and you think, oh my God, I'm gonna die. Oh my God, what does this mean for my survival? Right, the emotional component of the pain. And what's fascinating is it appears VR can tamp down both of those components. And that's been shown now in several studies. On the left is a very famous study, again, from the University of Washington group, looking at research subjects who are undergoing um, dressing changes for burn injuries, very severe burn wounds in a burn center. And the black bar is the virtual reality group, and the white bar is no virtual reality. And if you look from left to right, you'll see that it, the VR was associated with a reduction in both the worst pain, but also the time spent thinking about the pain and the unpleasantness of the pain. So there is both the physical, but also the cognitive and affective components of the pain. And curiously, they had more fun while they were undergoing a burn dressing change. On the right is a study from the University of Michigan uh, looking at women undergoing labor and delivery during childbirth. And of course, this is a natural experience, not something like a burn injury, but still certainly uh, can be painful or uncomfortable. And what this shows is people who are the subjects who are randomized to VR, same thing, described less pain intensity, less time thinking about the pain during labor, and less um, unpleasantness. So the VR reduced both the physical and emotional components of the pain in both of these studies. We have recently published this paper, uh, which is a follow-up study, a little larger study, again, looking at labor and delivery. Uh, it was run by Melissa Wong and Kim Gregory in our OB department at Cedar sinai And once again, demonstrated significant reductions in pain using a VR Lamaze-style program with um, controlled breathing exercises during labor and delivery. I'm gonna skip this, because uh, I've already talked a bit about it. So, what we've now been doing, I wanna take all this theory and just talk more about how we've been using it in real life uh, at Cedar sinai where I work. This is the largest hospital in the Western United States. We have uh, nearly a thousand beds and we approach our hospital like a large health services research laboratory where we can test out novel technologies and other interventions. And if you go into this hospital, like many hospitals, you find yourself in a room like this and uh, this is um, a private room, very nice in that regard. But make no mistake about it, being in a room like this is not a place of rest. It is not a place of healing. People in this room or in these rooms can suffer physically, emotionally, socially. They could feel stigmatized by, the, by their illness, separated from others. This is a biopsychosocial jail cell in a way. And if you sit in a bed in a room like this, this is what you look at all day. You see that TV set, you see the ceiling, and every so often somebody like me comes by, maybe at four or five in the morning, asking questions and poking and prodding, maybe not smiling, and then we disappear, and then we come back again, and this continues all day. This is not a restful place. So the question is, how can we allow people to escape the four walls of the hospital? We've been using virtual reality to give people this opportunity to go outside of this room, to, for example, swim with dolphins as this uh, patient is reaching out as a blue whale crosses her visual field in a, in a room. And we've been talking with our patients and learning about what works and what doesn't work. 
and how can we do a better job and what is the VR headset like and are people willing to use it? And we've been learning that people have different ideas about what works for them and where they really want to go. Some people want to go to Hawaii or to an ice cave or maybe on a safari. And, you know, so the idea is that we have to prescribe kind of the right therapy for the right patient at the right time. And sometimes it's just a distracting visit, but other times we're building skills and they're learning new techniques like breathing and uh, rehabilitation even. So what I want to show you now are two patients using virtual reality for the first time. So you get a sense of what their experience is like. So we'll see uh, if it helps with the pain or not. Mm -hmm. um, you'll tell us. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, any okay. questions about that? Pull that down over your eyes now. Oh, sorry about that. It just stopped on me. No. Should load up. Whoa. What do you see? Um, horses. Yep, okay. And mm -hmm. over the bridge. Is that, is mm -hmm. that working? Yes. What's happening now? The helicopter, waterfalls. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Iceland? No. With the music and everything, it's real peaceful. Oh, it's people. Hey. Oh, cool. So, what'd you think? It, it's really, it's pretty relaxing. Uh huh. Yeah, especially with the music and everything, and then the different scenery. Like, it was just one part where it's um, like a waterfall. You're sitting in a cave, right? And it's a waterfall right next to you. Almost made me forget I was here. Like, like, cause you're there. Right. It's like <clears throat> you're really there. You're hearing the waterfall and everything is a, like you look around and it's the whole scenery. Right. It's like you're immersed in it. How did it make you feel? Relaxed. Very relaxed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about the pain. You weren't? No, I wasn't. Really? I was just thinking about being there uh -huh. and having a good time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, let Dr. Herman know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Good. Okay. Yes, but I really did like it. I enjoyed it really much. Excellent. Thank you so much You're for welcome. picking me. So I can show you lots of studies, but and I will, um, but there's something about hearing from the patients firsthand that is compelling. And, and I had been seeing these stories and hearing from patients and realized that uh, we needed to study this further. So we did a couple studies. Um, this is one where we did a pretty simple study. It was a non-randomized study, but we did have a control group of um, 50 patients who uh, we measured their pain score before and then 10 minutes after a virtual reality experience. And then we had a control group that watched a two-dimensional screen, a relaxation video, and had 50 subjects do that. And uh, in both cases, we saw a reduction in pain, but we saw a greater reduction in favor of the virtual reality. And when we looked at it a different way in terms of whether they had a clinically important benefit, we saw a 65% response in the VR group versus a 40% response. That's a difference of 25%. And when we convert that into a statistic called the NNT or the number needed to treat, the number needed to treat was four. So for every four people that got VR, instead of the control condition, there was one additional person with a clinical benefit. And that NNT is rather low. It's, uh, it's lower than opioids, for example, um, for acute pain. Now we did a follow-up study where we did a proper prospective randomized control trial of 140 subjects. And they were able to keep the VR by their bedside throughout their hospital stay. And we, uh, had, uh, we monitored the nursing pain records. So the nurses were not part of the study. They didn't have any investment in the study. So the outcome was whatever the nurses were writing down the patient's pain scores over the course of their hospital stay. And the randomization was either between a uh, library of different VR experiences that people can choose among, or they can watch the health and wellness channel that's in their, um, in their room on the television set, which everyone has access to. And what we found was people randomized to virtual reality had a larger mean pain reduction compared to those randomized to the TV. And in particular on the right, if we looked at the people with the most severe pain, scores of eight, nine, or 10, patients who often have a very strong emotional overlay in addition to the physical experience, we saw a larger relative benefit in favor of virtual reality. Again, suggesting that the VR helps not just with the physical pain, but also the emotional cognitive components of pain. As a result of that, we're now looking to see, can it affect not just acute pain, but chronic pain? 
And just last week, we announced uh, new funding from the National Institutes of Health for a three-arm study in patients with chronic lower back pain. And this is a study where we'll follow people for up to 90 days. And uh, they'll be randomized to either a sham version of VR, just because just literally putting the headset on somebody's face may have a benefit, where they have access to relaxation videos, but in two-dimensional, like a widescreen TV, or they have access to the three-dimensional versions in immersive virtual reality, or the third arm is a skills-based VR, where people have access to, it's almost like having a pain psychologist at home with you using principles of cognitive behavioral therapy where people can learn about psychoeducation, pain education. They have breath training, whereas they breathe in and out, the uh, microphone and the headset detects the breathing and you can drive a metaphorical narrative. For example, breathe life back into a tree, um, learn how to relax using biofeedback and learning executive functioning. And the goal is not for people to live in VR, but to learn something about VR that they can then bring to the real world so that they can experience a more vivid and rich real uh, reality, not just a virtual reality. These are some pictures of the uh, ex experiences that people have access to, and they're, they're quite beautiful now, and the graphics have become very high quality. Now I want to um, move in my last part of the talk to a slightly different discussion, moving back to the University of Barcelona, where here I am being um, screen captured uh, by another one of Professor Slater's postdocs. And what she's doing is creating a volumetric capture of my body. And by doing so, she's going to turn me into a digital avatar so that I can then enter a uh, virtual environment. And after she's done that, uh, I find myself in a virtual reality environment like this. And you can't really tell what's happening yet. All you can see is my per first person view with my hands on a table. And I'm sitting across from another uh, figure. And as you'll find out in a moment, that other person's name is Daniel Dennett. Some of you may know Daniel Dennett uh, because he's a famous philosopher of mind. He has famous TED Talks, for example. It turns out Dr. Dennett, Professor Dennett, was, my, uh, was one of my mentors as an undergrad philosophy major at Tufts University all the way back in the early 1990s. And I hadn't seen him for many, many years. So all of a sudden I find myself across the table from him. And we used to have debates about the existence of God. Uh, I was sort of theistic and he wasn't, and he uh, sort of turned me into a, an agnostic. So I wanna show you now what happened in virtual reality. Now look in the mirror to your left. When the light next to you turns green, explain the challenge to the person in front of you using your own words. How can I explain consciousness without invoking a god? Why do you need to invoke a god? I don't understand why that even matters. Uh, it's hard to explain otherwise how what seems like an immaterial experience can be conveyed through material substance. Well, that's a classic uh, dualistic concept that the mind and the body are separate and distinct, but there's no reason to invoke an immaterial component to our consciousness in the first place. So sort of a false premise. So we go back and forth like that for several more minutes, and I have the entire video posted uh, on my website. And you might be wondering, how is he responding so fluidly? I mean, is this artificial intelligence? Because if it is, that's an incredible uh, version of AI that sort of passes the Turing test. Uh, but it's not, it's not AI at all. What I'm not showing you is that after I speak, what happens is I embody him. I become Professor Dennett. I find myself in his first person view and I'm looking back across the table at me. And then I hear me speak and I need to respond. And in order to respond, I need to summon my, from my memories, what would Professor Dennett have said to me at that time? And I was able to reproduce almost like a, like a marionette, like he was speaking through me. Um, and we were able to have an entire conversation. And in the end, he beat me again in this sort of ego-dissolving 
bizarre twisted exchange all in virtual reality. Now, how could this be useful clinically? Well, if you think about what is talk therapy, what is talk therapy is an opportunity to give you headspace from yourself to get out of your head and objectively think about what are your thoughts? What, uh, what about those maladaptive thoughts or just distorted thoughts that we often have? And it turns out that this is also being used to help treat anxiety and to treat depression and even to treat schizophrenia. The last study in the three is an interesting title, Conversations Between Self and Self as Sigmund Freud, a virtual body ownership paradigm for self-counseling. Here's an example of how it works. Very interesting study where you embody self-compassion within virtual reality. We all tend to be tough on ourselves. And it's very common advice from therapists to say, be easier on yourself, give yourself some self-compassion. This is a study of people with depression who were wired up and put into a virtual environment and they sit across from a child who's upset and crying. And they're asked to calm that child down by showing compassion with that child. And then what they don't expect is next thing they know, they are placed in that child's body. And they look back and they see an avatar of themselves being compassionate and being thoughtful. And that uh, switch in perspective is so powerful <clears throat> that people realize that they have this inner capacity to be so compassionate with themselves, but they didn't know they had it. And in this study, they were able to demonstrate reductions, statistical reductions in depression scores and people randomized to this paradigm versus others. And it was durable, not just immediately afterwards, but for a period of time afterwards. So I can go on and on, and I'm going to end here shortly um, by just pointing out that I'm just touching the surface today. I could tell you examples of how it's being used for dementia as, for example, a virtual reminiscence therapy, or how it's being used for stroke rehabilitation to help with uh, phantom limb therapy uh, or mirror therapy, how it's being used uh, for eating disorders like anorexia uh, and obesity and schizophrenia and smoking cessation and so on. <clears throat> um, and it's, uh, that will take us uh, several days to go through all that. So I'll stop there. But I do wanna point out that if VR is a therapy, then we need a VR pharmacy. As a physician, I need to be able to pick the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. If I use the same medicine for everybody, I'd be a pretty bad doctor. So I can't use the same software for everybody. And we're getting better at understanding what is available um, within the VR pharmacy. The FDA has been paying closer and closer attention to this. And uh, just before the pandemic, uh, we all went to, um, uh, to, uh, to the FDA uh, for this uh, public workshop on what is now being called medical extended reality or MXR. That's the term that the FDA is using to describe um, immersive therapeutics as MXR. And it's really interesting to see a combination of companies like Facebook and Microsoft and Sony and uh, academic medical centers like ours, Cedar sinai Hopkins, Stanford, and so on, all working together to try and build this, uh, build this field. One last thing I'll ask, I'll mention is, of course, we are and continue to be in a pandemic, is the concerns about safety. Um, we have a procedure that we go through. We use germicidal wipes. We uh, use alcohol-based lens wipes, and then we use a UV light box specifically designed for uh, VR headsets. It's created by Cleanbox. I have no relationship with Cleanbox other than I bought their box. Uh, they have claimed that it has uh, over 99% uh, virucidal rates against uh, coronavirus and other viruses, waiting for that to be published. Uh, but when we combine it all and then finally add tincture of time uh, with a quarantine, uh, this is a procedure that has been considered uh, safe by our uh, epidemiology um, team and we use it for our studies. Um, we do have a website if you want to learn more about virtual medicine and virtual reality in medicine. It's called uh, virtualmedicine.health and virtualmedicine.org and um, typically we have uh, live in-person events once a year but now we have switched that to webinar series. Our next webinar will be on October 6th it's a free webinar. This is a YouTube live event. If you go to virtualmedicine.health, you can uh, learn more about it up there. And you can also watch videos, uh, some of which I showed you today, and learn more about our research, which we all have posted here. Uh, all of this I have put into, um, oh, this is normally uh, what happens pre-pandemic, by the way. So 
this is uh, our usual uh, conferences. And we even had a guy have, who was scalping tickets last time around, which is pretty incredible. Um, I've put all this into a book. I'm very uh, proud of uh, three years of work to uh, write this book. This is a wide release book with basic books out of New York and Hachette Book Group. Mm -hmm. This will be publishing on October 6th. And this is a book that really is, it's about virtual reality, but it's about what does VR teach us about consciousness? What does it teach us about how our mind works? And it's a combination of neuro, neuro, uh, neuropsychology, philosophy, um, clinical medicine, and technology. And I tell the stories, the frontline stories of VR and review the, uh, the evidence um, and talk about what this means about the future uh, of healthcare. And so this will be released on October 6th. It's available right now. Uh, on Amazon, on basic books, and so on, if you're interested in learning more about what I talked about today. So since I come from Hollywood, I'll end with this scroll. Uh, since uh, there's a lot of people that have um, participated in the work that I've been showing you today, I also uh, am very active on Twitter and uh, write regularly about medical virtual reality. So you can check that out if you're interested. And also our team has a, uh, has a Twitter handle for our virtual medicine program at Cedar sinai um, so thank you again for the organizers. Uh, sorry for the few minutes of uh, technical glitches and I appreciate the time uh, to speak with you guys today. Well, I know that if we were not in a COVID situation, there'd be a roar of applause right now. Um, okay. Sorry if we are not able to provide the, that, but uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that. It was fascinating. Um, I know that uh, I, I had seen pieces of that right before that F FDA meeting when uh, at the talk in uh, um, at Vanderbilt, um, and right. it was uh, every bit as interesting seeing the second time uh, those parts. Uh, we we have one question, and I would encourage people to c continue to ask uh, ask questions um, for a few minutes we have uh, available here. Uh, the question is from Esan. Uh, how do you different, differentiate whether the pain reduction is caused by excitement of the patient from using a new technology versus the immersive effect of VR? So I would, I would call that the shiny effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and is, it, is it reproducible? And so there's been uh, several studies now that have looked at the reproducibility of the pain reduction uh, over time. Um, when I say several, I mean three or four studies. And they've all been consistent in demonstrating that there is a recurrent benefit, for example, in the pain studies, um, that it's not just a, a one and done uh, impact, but that it seems to um, have benefits repeatedly. But as you can imagine, eventually, you know, you get used to, used to it. It's not meant to be a trick, by the way. We're not tricking the brain. What we're doing is giving people insight that their brain matters and giving them access to their imagination, which we all have uh, normally. So the hope is not that people will continue using VR every single time they have pain, but rather that they're learning something about their mind and body and how it's connected. And I don't mean spiritually, I mean, I, I mean literally physically, um, the embodiment of pain. And when people recognize that they do have this inner capacity to modify their pain experience, and it's not necessarily treating the underlying cancer or the underlying neurological condition, but it is modifying how they experience it then we don't need to ask the question of does it keep working over and over again. We hope that it works because people learn how to use their mind differently. That's really the goal. But in any way, there are a few studies that have shown uh, beyond the shiny object initial experience. Uh, I would say that's why we are using sham VR, by the way, in our new NIH study to help answer that question more formally. It's a very good question. Uh, you, you either saw or, or predicted the next question, which was why, why sham VR um, yeah. from Dr. P Persky from the NIH. Ah, oh. <laughs> Dr. Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe double checking on you. From <laughs> no. Yeah, well, um, Dr. Persky has um, uh, been a, a great uh, a colleague and has helped us with developing our, um, our VR uh, trial for NIH. And you know, exactly. Um, great question to help give me a chance to sort of express that. But yeah, just literally the, the, there's something almost honorific of getting a device, getting something of value. Uh, and that alone may have some, you know, placebo benefit. Um, plus just putting it on and experiencing these relaxing environments um, in two dimensions may still have important therapeutic benefits. And if that's all it takes, then maybe we don't need to have fancy virtual reality. 
Maybe all we need to do is show people, you know, nice uh, scenes on t in two dimensions. Um, so, you know, that's a, a real possibility. So we're trying to disentangle how much of this is just having the headset and how much of this is the, mo the mode of administration and the way it's being uh, experienced. Fantastic. Um, so there are a lot of questions coming in now. Um, the, what is the best place to see all of these studies and get in the queue for suggestions of other studies? Uh, you shared your website there, but is there, do we have a, a repository of, of all the studies you re referenced? Um, that's a great question. So um, the book is one repository. So I'm uh, summarizing every, everything that I talked about today is in, in the book as well. Uh, but the really, I'm not aware of an online, I mean, other than clinicaltrials.gov, where you can, of course, go and look at any registered trial, including our own, and learn more about any VR trial that's ongoing. It, it really re requires registration on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, but I'm not aware of a, of a singular kind of source for that uh, in terms of like a website. On our website, we certainly post our own research, um, but uh, not the world's research. So I'm not aware of a, of a resource like that other than clinicaltrials.gov. Okay. Um, from Cash, uh, I've read your article on embodied cognition in the New York Times and blew my mind. Is the tolerance to pain increased because of awareness consciousness is drawn by the visual stimuli, like seeing a dolphin pod? So, I mean, is the tolerance to pain increased because the awareness is drawn to the visual stim stimuli? Yeah, I think... Um, that's probably true. It, it really has to do again with that idea of um, distraction or inattentional blindness. Um, you know, the prefrontal cortex, the part right behind the forehead is the part that really uh, um, swings our spotlight of attention around. So, you know, we are this state of consciousness. We can get into the philosophy of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk too long. Um, uh, and, you know, we have a, a, a field of awareness, um, both sensorial, what we see, what we taste, what we feel, what we smell, et cetera, but also cognitive thoughts uh, emerge in our mind and all our experience are all are occurring within that same space of consciousness. And so the prefrontal cortex sort of decides what am I going to focus on? And uh, if it's focusing on the sensorial experience of pain, then a certain amount of bandwidth is taken up doing that. And it's not able to think about other things. So VR is like a, um, almost like a, a Trojan horse that gets in the front gates of the eyeball and blows up into the brain. And the brain is like, wow, the, the pre prefrontal cortex starts to pay attention to that. And as a result, swings that spotlight away from the uh, noxious stimuli um, of pain. But it does more than that. And I'll just very briefly very say, briefly say um, the uh, brain, the brain also can, also can inhibit. Oh, hi, oh, I'm getting some uh, feedback. The brain can also inhibit pain signals from coming up the spinal cord through these descending inhibitory pathways. And if the brain is in a certain state of mind, let's call it, uh, it can release these signals down and block through these so-called virtual gate theory uh, pain processing from coming up into the brain. So it may be that the brain can also fight back and stop the pain from even coming up. So anyway, I don't know if that helps or makes it more complicated, but that's a quick response. That's great. Um, another question was, have you found any forms or sources of pain for which VR treatment is ineffective or notably less effective? Yeah, and I don't want people to leave this thinking, oh my God, this is a miracle cure for pain, because it is, it is not. Um, pain, uh, VR do, does certainly help with pain. Not in everyone, not every time, but then again, nothing really works every time for pain. So it's a tool that we use. Um, and what we have found though is in at least, um, uh, the study we did, we, we enrolled patients uh, of many, with many different kinds of pain, visceral pain, somatic pain, neurological pain, cancer pain. And what we found in at least a regression model is it did not matter what type of pain people had, we saw similar pain reductions with v in the VR arm. And that's probably because VR is working centrally, right? It's not working at the site of the pain, it's working at the way the pain is being experienced and processed. So we have not found um, that there's a particular type of pain that is any more or less susceptible. Other than the more severe the pain, um, the more susceptible it appears to be to virtual reality, as I showed in that, in that one slide. Oh, I see Danielle Collins is on, so thanks for that comment, Danielle. Danielle uh, will be speaking in our upcoming uh, webinar as well on October 6th. 
Fantastic. Um, uh, two more questions, if you have just a moment. Um, I will mention to the, the audience that we do have the workshop starting how to build and manage an XR training application on track one. Uh, and in 15 minutes, we'll be coming back for our, our DOD panel. But um, Tom Grubb uh, from Johns Hopkins ARL asks, have, your, have there been any studies with AR as the syringe? Yeah. Um, yeah, they, so yes, um, I've been focused more on VR, so I'm not as familiar with the AR, therapeutic AR literature, um, but certainly there's no reason why AR can't itself be uh, a therapeutic platform. I showed one example of that study of psilocybin versus what I called an MR, mixed reality, but essentially that was an AR example. Um, and it, it achieved similar phenomenology as the psychedelic psilocybin. So, uh, although I've been talking a lot about VR, uh, XR is a better is a better term, um, and AR is part of that. And uh, I just haven't seen as many uh, high quality, and I could be wrong. These others on this in this audience may be familiar with high quality randomized trials using AR with clinically relevant outcomes. I just haven't seen as many of those yet. I think it's. Uh, I, I agree that I have not, I have not, I haven't seen those either. And but there have been a number of use cases using AR for clinical practice, as opposed in particular ways, um, mm -hmm. including an AR-enabled um, central line kit and, and mm -hmm. AR-enabled syringes. I think, uh, but those are actually for the doctor to have AR um, and help help with the actual administration. Right, right. Um, and then finally, as we close out, uh, and thank you so much for your patience, uh, uh, doctor, as well as the audience and, and the technical issues uh, getting started. Um, can you tell me, again from Dr. Persky, can you tell me a bit about the importance of the control condition in the studies? Um, yeah. Um, well, I think any study, I mean, First of all, it's important to have controls. Um, you know, uh, I had a professor in grad school that um, in the middle of his lecture, he asked this really bizarre question to us. He said, how does a chair compare? And that's it, he stopped. And we were all silent. And somebody said, compare to what? And he said, exactly. You can't, it's a ridiculous question. How does a chair compare to a table? How does a chair compare to a stool? you know, you can't say anything about the chair until you speak about it in relation to something else in the world. And the same applies to a therapeutic intervention. You know, it's very common historically to see case series of some treatment like remdesivir for um, COVID-19. That was a case series in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first people said is, well, where's the control group? I mean, that's a step backwards to do a study that doesn't have a control group. Since then, we now have a control group. But we need control groups. Then the question is, what is the right control? And in VR, that can be tricky. Um, so I gave an example where I use VR versus a television set, but it, that could be criticized. Like, well, that's not fair because just giving the VR headset may have that shiny object appeal, which is why the sham VR we think is a very important advance. And we'd like to see more studies using sham VR. So this is the first time we'll be using sham VR. Others certainly have. Um, we're not the first to, to propose that. But we think the most rigorous approach is to have a sham VR. I, I will say that we had another grant we submitted with a sham VR, and one of the critiques was the sham was too strong. They said the sham VR is too strong. So I've never been critiqued for having too strong of a control condition. <laughs> that's all right. That's another story. Um, I, I didn't notice somebody asked about is there a board of ethical use of VR. I haven't seen that. Um, I write a lot about that in this book in terms of the ethics of this, and I, I'll put that discussion aside for now. Uh, I skipped a slide where we um, have published some best practices for developing and validating VR interventions. Um, and that's on our website. And that includes some ethical considerations and just methodological considerations for how to create XR interventions for healthcare. So we've put out sort of like a blueprint for how to do that. And that's on our website. 